So, Bob, we got more emails from more patrons for us to answer morally. Let's do it. What do you say? That's, <laughs> I like this new adverb, morally. <laughs> this is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I am your host, Dr. Karkonda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Who are you, Bob Gettle? I am a therapist here in practice in Seattle, seeing mostly couples and doing a little bit of that DBT skills training and your old friend from grad school. Yeah. And I'm trying not to do that head turn with the mic thing this this week. That's my goal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just a peek behind the curtain for everyone. I am a very anal person when it comes to sound quality of the podcast. And normally people come to, to my office, Bob will mm -hmm. come and sit down mm -hmm. and I have everything set up for him. But during the pandemic, I've had to engineer everyone's home home recording studio over right. Zoom. Right. Bob has done a fantastic job because he sounds he sounds wonderful. It really accentuates his soothing bass tones. Listener Kayla from Rhode Island, a clinician, says, "You mention at some point that it's normal for clients to experience." attraction or horniness for their therapist. That sounds like it could mess up a therapeutic relationship though. The client might actually act differently or give answers that they think will impress their therapist if they were attracted to the therapist. That seems like a potentially big problem leading to jealousy, etc. How should the therapist deal with this potential attraction or lust from a client I'm really curious, and I feel like this issue is going to come up at some point in my career. Bob, what do you think? I say it's good that it's coming up, and then I'm reminded of Sandra Lippincott. Remember her? Yeah. Yeah, she was our ethics professor, among mm -hmm. other things. Um, and she talked about a situation, I don't remember the details, where a client was attracted to her and how she handled it. And if I remember correctly, uh, maybe I don't, maybe I'm just thinking about how I would handle it, is matter-of-factly, straightforward, it just happens right? People do. They, they have sometimes erotic feelings towards anybody, towards a teacher, towards um, someone at the grocery, I don't know, th towards anybody. And when you share intimacy with a therapist, sometimes erotic transferences come up and it's totally cool. And being matter of fact about them and accepting that that's the case and helping normalize that for the client is doing them a huge favor because chances are in our weird culture, they, they, they may very well feel shamed of having those feelings and think that they're wrong or bad and they shouldn't ever, ever, ever talk about them because that's a bad part of them. So uh, we owe it to our clients, I believe, to be open, matter of fact, to let therapy be a forum in which anything can be talked about and that those feelings are never acted on. Yeah. Yeah, well said. The only thing I'll add is that it's helpful sometimes to at least conceptualize it as a therapist and maybe communicate that to the client. It can be an expression of attachment security, meaning that mm -hmm. for the very first time in someone's life, they feel like they have an, a secure attachment and it's with their therapist. And in that moment, there's a number of ways to conceptualize it, but all one's feelings comes out, including erotic uh, feelings. Mm -hmm. Your feelings of dependency come out, your feelings of of love and affection come out, your feelings of, of like, uh, I can't believe that this person actually listens to me, and feelings of, of uh, lust or of romantic attraction, because the, the body is like, finally, I am safe enough to feel mm -hmm. something for someone. And I uh, I've, I've been looking for parents to depend on. I've been looking for friends I can truly rely on. And I've been looking for romantic partners who make me feel safe. This person, I'm just going to point all guns a blazing at this person because uh, well, that's not a great metaphor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point all of my needs toward this person because they're, I finally found someone safe. Um, another way of seeing it is that as a child, we will meld with people through dependency. Mm -hmm. As an adult, we will meld with people often through romance or sex. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're in a childish place, meaning mm -hmm. that we're having corrective experiences that we are correcting for neglect or abuse as a child. And But we're an adult now. And so the way it f 
comes out, the way it feels to us is, is a romantic interpretation, but really more fundamentally what's happening for the client is a, is a deep feeling of wanting to meld with mm -hmm. this other human being because mm -hmm. when we meld with others, we feel truly warm and enveloped and safe. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. other uh, uh, possible conceptualization, depending, is that it's a defense against deeper dependence, mm -hmm. that for some people they will be very afraid of dependency and will route their feelings towards a safer expression, which is romance or sex, mm -hmm. instead of going deeper of, of, I'm actually going to a very young place, mm -hmm. two, three years old, and depending on this person in this way, which is okay too, it's, it's just a normal phase. Um, but you're asking as a clinician, you know, do, does it uh, interfere? And no, uh, I've never had it interfere with treatment. I mean, it can, I suppose, temporarily. I've had clients ask me out on a date in the middle of session. and uh, But it's a, just an opportunity to have a conversation and and to provide a corrective experience around not shaming someone and not pushing them away. Mm -hmm. I hear them and I'm and I explain, you know, I can't do that. I, I mm -hmm. you know, I, I hear you and I, I appreciate that that's what you're wanting to do and I'm guessing you thought about it beforehand, but but that's not what this relationship is and, and you know, I guess we can talk about this or not. Um, the other is is some clients will flirt instead of working in therapy. I, I've had clients who will purely I it takes me a while to usually catch on because this is kind of a rare event, but uh, I can think of one client who, it, after a number of sessions, I it suddenly hit me that I think her primary mode with me was flirting and not one of therapy. And once I had that thought, I suddenly rewrote the entire story that we had together <laughs> over the number of sessions. And and I wondered, I, I didn't really ever know for sure, but, and then for various different reasons, therapy ended not too long after that. And mm -hmm. I never really knew, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I never knew, was she ever actually in therapy or was the whole time her flirting with me mm -hmm. and trying to impress me in this way. And that can happen. And you could say it's interfering with, with treatment, but in the best of cases, it's an opportunity to, talk about things and to uh, provide a safe place to talk about those things. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, You also mentioned in your longer email, Kayla, about possible jealousy between partners. Uh, I've never had that happen. I've never had a couple where they come in and one person is attracted. And I've never even heard of that. Although I have heard about couples acknowledging, not with me, but acknowledging their attraction, maybe even mutual attraction for a therapist. Mm. You might have a lesbian a couple that that's the couple I'm thinking about. These are actually friends of mine. And both of them were romantically and sexually attracted to their woman therapist. Mm -hmm. And it was long-term therapy and there was a lot of conversations about it. And I don't really know exactly how it went, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I suppose that can happen. But if you're good as a therapist, then, you know, you, you navigate that stuff. It doesn't, it, I mean, uh, on a scale of difficulty, it's actually not that hard to deal with. I mean, there's much harder things to deal with in therapy. Patron Ashley from New York says, Dear Kirk and Bob, I was hoping you would be able to provide some advice about what to do when your mental health is negatively impacting your job. I truly enjoy my job and have steadily moved up in my career. I can't seem to focus or care like I used to, and I am incredibly behind in my work. Every day I wake up with so much dread and anxiety because how far behind I am, and, that, uh, and then I end up paralyzed with fear. I'm physically exhausted from spending every day afraid that my boss will find out and my career will come to a crashing end. This has been happening for over a year now, so it's not because of COVID. I have s childhood sexual trauma that I've never processed, and this is currently occupying so much of my, of my emotional resources. Plus, I experienced sexual assault this past year and have been dealing with marital issues. Hmm. I've also been abusing alcohol several times a week just to cope, and I know it's hurting me, but I continue to do it anyway. 
I hate myself for being such a crappy employee right now, especially because my job is usually meaningful and fulfilling to me, and I know so many people out there have lost their jobs due to the pandemic. Any suggestions on what my options might be? Might be? FYI, I am currently in therapy with my uh, with a therapist I love, and mm-hmm. I take Weberchen and Adderall due to my diagnoses. Mm-hmm. Bob, what do you think? Um, the last part is a self-critical guilt trip. Uh, how did she put it? She uh, other yeah other people have lost their jobs due to the pandemic. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, that's functional. In other words, that's that self-criticism is wanting to serve as a function. It ser- it's wanting to serve a function for you, um, and it is also cement shoes. It's dead weight. So if it were me, I would be talking with my counselor about my self-critical thoughts and guilt and shame. So that's one thing. So talk about that with your personal counselor. The other thing is you've, you've, you've had a hell of a year. You just you said that you're having trouble in your marriage. You were sexually assaulted. You're working with old trauma. I mean, these are major things, and I can't help but think that they would be an interference in your ability to focus and concentrate on your job. It seems like you're expecting quite a lot from yourself. So some thoughts that came to mind is, can you seek support somewhere? Maybe your boss is uh, an ally who would be supportive, or maybe there are other folks there who would be um, supportive. And then just in terms of nuts and bolts, one of the things that we know is that chunking tasks into bite-sized pieces is a great way to kind of um, get things done. So, um, Mount Everest weren't climbed in a day. It was climbed in stages, step by step by step. And every step is a step towards getting to the top. So, um, I would, uh, want you to both be kind with yourself and also break those tasks into bite-sized pieces because getting a little bit done is better than fretting about getting nothing done and driving yourself crazy. Right. Exactly. So here are my four things that I thought of when I read this earlier. Number one is keep talking with the therapist, obviously. Number two is what Bob is getting at, which is recovering from trauma is exhausting. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's definitely going to affect one's work. So don't beat yourself up for that. Uh, I might even tell your boss. I, I have clients who will just go to their boss and say, look, I was abused growing up and I'm going through treatment around that. And I'm not going to be at my best, and I, I just want you to know because I really care about this job, and uh, I hope you will give me some slack. Uh, human beings, including bosses, are likely to be cool with that, and it, if they can help you by giving you some slack, I mean, you know, uh, it's similar to going through cancer treatment or something. Uh, there was a, f- a number of years back where uh, I had four coworkers go through breast cancer chemotherapy at the university. And uh, uh, and some of them were actually um, my employees, technically, since I was chair. Mm-hmm. And oh, at least I think that's how it worked out. The, any, at any rate, we had no problem just saying, take as much time off as you need. Uh, don't worry about teaching your classes. Don't worry about answering emails. Uh, just do what you got to do. And, and that lasted for months for these individuals. Because we're humans and we care. <laughs> and so let's not treat our workplaces like they don't include human beings. Mm-hmm. The, the other thing is, is that some trauma survivors are prone to work perfectionism. I've seen this before, mm. where because of the trauma you went through, there's this notion of constantly trying to be safe, obviously. And some people found early in life that if they're perfect, then they're more safe than if they're not. And that'll translate into work perfectionism. And the trauma survivor is in this hypervigilance of constantly trying to be perfect, but never really being perfect and also never really feeling safe because they haven't recovered from their traumas yet. So uh, routing all that anxiety into being perfect at work or even just liking your work. I mean, that, that's another thing as well is like, okay, you used to like your work and now you don't like it so much anymore. That's okay. It happens to people. It happens to a lot of people. The other thing is you talked about alcohol abuse. I would tell your therapist about this, obviously. And it's probably not helping overall, as you're saying. And it probably is a self-medicating situation, as you are actually pointing out. And so I, I might actually revisit your medication 
possibly, I don't know. Maybe therapy is going too fast, I don't know. But the alcohol abuse, uh, as you're stating it, uh, I'm sure is, is not helping your mood. It, one of the things that people don't know or think about or talk about much is that when, when you drink, you pour a bunch of you know, compounds into your nervous system, into your brain, and your brain tries to adjust for it. Your brain mm-hmm. is saying, whoa, the pendulum has swung way over here. And in a nutshell, and I'm not a neurologist, but um, the way to think about it is that you have a, a flood of, of um, euphoria feelings and, and brain chemistry. That's why people, when they drink, they're like, I love you, man. And that's why everything seems awesome. That's why it's easier to socialize. That's why, that's why people drink. You also feel less stress. Well, the, the brain essentially says, we have too much euphoria going on. We have too many relaxing uh, things going on. We're out of balance. We, they, and the brain doesn't know why. The brain isn't like, well, eventually the alcohol will go away. The brain says, we got to kick in all the homeostatic mechanisms to pull the brain back into balance, which means we got we to gotta pump all the stress hormones, we got to reduce the euphoria things because something's wrong in our brain. So the next day, the hangover can be physio- phys- physiological, meaning that you're sick and this sort of thing, but your brain is also reeling from the pendulum swing and it's swinging the other way and depression and anxiety and sleep problems and uh, you know, hyperactivity and distraction, all that stuff can be thrown off for days. And you just have to be, you just have to know that about yourself, everyone out there, that, uh, that, that process and that mood disruption can last for days. Uh, not only just in the way I'm describing it, but also it can screw up sleep, which can have reverberations through the rest of your week. And so um, everyone just try to be as, as knowledgeable about that as possible and don't just think, well, uh, I, I'm not sick the next day, so everything is fine. You actually really want to monitor your mood and your anxiety. Uh, the last thing here is burnout. You sound, you sound like you're burnt out, frankly. Uh, you, you have a job that you really like and used to be fulfilling it, but right now it's just like you can't stand doing it. You dread it. You know, anytime you're talking about, I dread going to work, that sounds like burnout to me and something's got to change because that burnout is not likely to stop unless Mm. something happens. You can't will burnout away. That's just not possible. It's like you're running a marathon and your muscles are sore. You can't will yourself to run another marathon. (laughs) Your body is, is burnt out. The brain can be burnt out in certain modes and with certain kinds of uh, things. The brain is, is a physical thing. And so vacation, maybe changing a position, maybe scaling back, maybe telling your boss to stop overloading you. And this is another thing that, you know, people might call, call me a pinko for this, but it's up to labor to push back on the managers. There's a constant inherent tension between manager and labor. The manager is being told by the owners or the people who make the most money that you have to drive the labor as hard as you can and get the most production out of them for the least amount of money. That's, that's their job. That's manager's jobs or owners, you know, whoever's in charge. It's labor's job to push back. It's labor's job to say, no, we're not, as a collective, we are not going to do that. Uh, My job is ruining my home life. That's not okay. My job has so many expectations and there's so much to do. You're the manager, you manager, you're giving me so much to do that I can't get my job done without having physiological and psychological symptoms. So you have to say, no, I'm not going to do that. And you can't make us do that. And as a collective, we're not going to do that. And if, if, if need be, unionizing or, or going on strike. We have lost sight of that in the last 20, 30 years. There was a time, I remember this, when I was a kid, 
when the idea of working overtime was absurd. The idea of working more than 40 hours a week was, was un-American in, in a lot of ways. Today, hardly anyone works just 40 hours a week. Salary jobs, particularly in Seattle, tech jobs, these are jobs people are expected to work 50, 60 hours a week and then work when they're at home over emails and this sort of thing. This is, this is natural. This is manager's job. They are supposed to pressure us, but we are supposed to push back. We are supposed to say no. That's the way this works. That's the only way it works. It'd be like going to court and the defense attorney just gives up and the prosecutor always wins. That's not okay. You need to have both sides coming to the table ready to fight. And if you are being oppressed and you're burnt out on your job and you need things to be scaled back, then you need to say, no, I'm not going to do that. And we need to do that. And we need to tell managers, no, that's not okay. And then the managers will live with it. You know, there are people, I, I, I had a client uh, for years who suffered, you know, a good portion of our sessions were spent talking about this, where they had f laid off a few positions and just given all that work to my client even though my client already had a full-time job. They had just foisted three other, I don't know how many jobs, like one or one to three other jobs onto her. And she was uh, upset about that. And being the way she was raised, she just accepted it. She was raised by an alcoholic person mm -hmm. and learned to put her feelings aside and discount herself. And we spent a lot of time on that. And managers will exploit the psychological damage that we have been through as children to squeeze as much juice out of our lemons as they can. And you have to push back. So, uh, so uh, patron Ashley, uh, get angry and, and push back. Uh, the other thing, again, is what Bob was saying is like, you know, recovering from trauma takes a long time, take baby steps and, and there's a, you're on a journey you have, and you were, you were sexually assaulted earlier this year. So you have a lot of trauma to recover from and it affects all sorts of aspects of one's life, including work. And mm -hmm. I would just get as much support and, and advocacy as possible. All right, let's take a break, Bob. When we get back, let's answer more questions. What do you say? Yes. All right, we're back from the break. Anonymous patron, he writes... Can a, can a traumatic birth affect attachment style? Can a traumatic birth affect attachment style? So there's a lot of details here. After, after a lot of thought and listening to your podcast, I think I'm, I am a quiet borderline. Remember what quiet borderline means, Bob? No, I actually don't remember what it means. Well, quiet borderline on the internet anyway, it's not a, I don't think a technical term are people who suffer from the internal experience of a borderline, but not the stereotypical, I want to emphasize external borderline behaviors like being oh. demanding or being abusive or being annoying or suing people or, you know, the kind of stereotypical, although not by any means universal. Or so there's, right. So there's this, so there's this term that's cropped up, I believe, on the internet called quiet borderline. So, hmm. uh, so he's saying, a lot of, after a lot of thought and listening to your podcast, I think I am a quiet borderline. I have a schema of defectiveness, and I usually pull away from people whenever I get too close, just out of fear of rejection. I put others' needs before mine and never ask for help. Hmm. I desperately crave closeness, but I don't want to bother people, and I double check if I am welcome or not. From the outside, I come across as a normal guy, although distant. <clears throat> very few people, very few people know me. Hmm. I've had thoughts of hurting myself, but ever since hmm. I got medicated for depression and anxiety, I don't get that anymore. Hmm. However, I see no sign of abandonment, neglect, or mistreatment from my parents. My twin brother, although shy, doesn't exhibit the same problems as I do. I'm an identical twin, and I was born in breech position, and the doctor said I suffered at birth unlike my twin brother. By the way, my therapist doesn't like these categories like borderline, so he refuses to talk about attachment styles and, and like preoccupied, that kind of thing. Oh. So, Bob, can a traumatic birth, 
like what he's saying here is, you know, he had a, what do you say here? Breach. Uh, yeah, breach position. And the doc, doctor said he suffered at birth. And so he's, he's saying, you know, I think I'm a quiet borderline. My, my twin brother doesn't seem to have that. Uh, why do I have that? And I look back at my life and I don't see any problems in my parents' parenting. What's going on here? What do you think? Well, one of the things that's true is that everybody has a different experience of growing up. And so even a twin isn't necessarily going to have the same experience as you have. Um, you're not the same person. So whatever roles you take in your family, however that unfolds, um, that, you know, people have different experiences growing up. Um, I don't, well, I was about to say the thing I always say, which is, I don't know if it really matters if you are a quiet borderline or not. Um, what matters is what's happening for you, which is you're lonely, you're sad, you wish for connection and you don't have any, you worry a lot about how you come across and whether or not other people see you as a bother or a burden. And you may be vulnerable to over-interpreting um, that or not taking in the evidence that that's not true. You know that you're distant, that other people, that you look like a regular person, but perhaps distant. So um, so the, th the thing that leapt to mind is uh, radically open DBT, which is worth looking up if you want to look it up. And I don't know if what people call quiet borderline is what the RODBT people called over-controlled, which is uh, DBT was developed for folks who have trouble with emotion dysregulation. RODBT, or radically open DBT, was developed for folks who have trouble with over-regulation or over-control. So they don't do the acting out that um, is what people think of when it comes to um, borderline personality disorder. If anything, they internalize a lot more. And that's how you sound, uh, person writing in. So uh, Tom Lynch is uh, the developer of RODBT. I, he's a professor in, I think it at UNC, North Carolina. Um, and uh, there's a really interesting website about RODBT that's worth a look. So I hope that you will check it out. Yeah. Um, the only thing I'll add to that mm -hmm. is to piggyback on what you're saying, Bob, around every child experiences the family differently. And as you're saying, Bob, there are different roles that kids will play. And the other thing I'll say is that it's hard sometimes, and I've worked with a lot of people on this, obviously a lot of clients, but a lot of students as well as they investigate their childhoods, that at first glance, you would look at a family and be like, well, everything was fine because there's no overt problems. There's no yeah. uh, uh, abuse, like you weren't sexually abused. You, you were never hit by your parents. But there can be very subtle emotional uh, communication that can definitely not be very easily detected by anyone, including the people participating in it, that can lead to personality issues and emotional uh, traumas, if you will, relational traumas. And especially if you're in a family where there was a high value on loyalty and not complaining, oh. you might have started to realize when you were three or four that something was wrong, kind of, but it was emotionally uh, beat out of you, if you will, bec mm. by the the sort of brainwashing of the family of never talk about the negative, never think about the negative. And so I've been with a lot of people as they uh, discover, oh, I guess there was some issues there in my, I'm, I guess I am starting to see <clears throat> potential issues in my parents' parenting. But having said that, who knows? A lot of things can happen, and your 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 specific question about traumatic birth is that yes, traumatic birth can be emotionally traumatic. We often look at infants, particularly newborns, as not incurring trauma. Right? It's like, well, their brain isn't developed; they're too young; they won't remember it. No, a child can uh, be traumatized at that very early age and have psychological problems later on. It, it's complicated, though, because their brain is not fully formed. At, by the time they're six months old, even, there's already a lot of changes in the brain. But 
you obviously can be and and it can lead to a bunch of cascading events that work themselves out systemically like there are and again it's hard to know because we don't have a way of really measuring this but let's say you have a kid who has a difficult birth for one reason or another and well, let's just say for the sake of argument that the parents, they don't even know which one it was. <laughs> you know, they're just like, uh, we don't know which one, but of the twins. But one of the kids is just a little bit more afraid, a little bit more upset, a little bit more distressed as, you know, within the first week of life and or first week after birth. And that child is a little bit more frustrating to the parents and the parents maybe pull away a little bit because it's like, oh, this kid will never go down to sleep. And, and we could imagine that that could happen to a kid who went through a very difficult birth, right? That's just like uh, they entered the world in this very scary, uh, life-threatening situation. Now, of course, they don't cognitively know what's happening, but very uncomfortable, let's just put it that way. And that can lead to... Uh, the parent kind of pulling away a little bit, which causes the kid to be more distressed, which causes the parents to pull away a little bit more or something you know, being treated a little bit differently. And then that just cascades and you fast forward three months, six months, and now you have a completely different personality in among identical twins just because of the way things kind of started. And that can absolutely happen. And you know, I could see that developing into a personality issue. But who knows? Uh, it's hard to know. I, and I've worked with people sometimes where we never really figure out where their borderline came from. We're just like, yeah, it, it, it never felt satisfying. It, you know, they never walked away uh, saying, yeah, you know what? I have a pretty good sense of who to blame for why I am the way that I am. There's some people, it's just, it, it just hard to tell. Now, I will say 98%, it's clear. <laughs> We, we all understand. It is a very easy a causal link that we are making. Uh, obviously, abuse, uh, mistreatment, this kind of thing. But occasionally, it, we're, it's, it is a bit of a mystery. And we just have to recognize that the brain and personality is variable and interesting and not easy to lock down. And it's a, it's a soft science. It's not a hard science by any means. Up at your patron, Nardine from Canada says, I'm a recent PsyD grad. After listening to your podcast, I finally started my own therapy. I am curious about your thoughts about therapists and therapy, especially for novice therapists going to therapy. As a client, I find myself overthinking like crazy in session, conceptualizing and intellectualizing. Do you find that therapists sometimes have a difficult time being a client in therapy, especially if it is not something that they've been doing prior to their training? Bob, what do you think? You're a therapist in therapy. And I am. Have you treated therapists? Yes. Cool. Um, the question is, do I think that therapists in therapy fall into overanalyzing? Yeah. Or intellectualizing? Or they yeah, have suppose, a difficult time being a client, you know? Yeah. I think lots of people have a difficult time being a client. I don't know that therapists are unique in any way. They do the same things that other people do. The same defenses, you know, could be intellectualizing or could be something else. Um, so I don't know that there's anything specific to therapists in therapy. I like that you are noticing that, and I hope that you will talk to your therapist about that and that you guys get to talk about, oh, what kicked off? What triggered this intellectualizing that I find myself in? Do I want to pay attention to myself on uh, an emotional level? Not because emotions are magic and so interesting and by themselves um, what are important. What I think are important about emotions are is that they um, – often are signposts to where there's an attachment need. That's interesting. That's important. So intellectualizing will keep me away from my feelings and not paying attention to my feelings might interfere with me understanding what my attachment need is and how it's my attachment and security is um, coming up. And uh, then therefore doing something corrective about it, like in the experience of the relationship with therapist. If you stick, stay stuck in intellectualization and we don't talk about it, then the therapy stalls. I don't think people get all that much out of it. Um, they probably find it a little bit dull or um, disappointing or dissatisfying. So 
there's no need for you to to do that but because you have this lovely insight into yourself and you know that you're doing that and now you get to talk about it and it might be scary and it'll probably be worthwhile yeah i agree um so the way i'd answer it is do some therapists have trouble in therapy and i would say it's rare i i don't think it happens very often either the therapy they're either the client doesn't really want to be in therapy if this is happening because because that can happen some mm-hmm. programs will force people to go to therapy and that's a tough situation to deal with someone who's just like well i don't really have anything to talk about but i'm supposed to be in therapy or the client therapist relationship isn't strong and if it were stronger the the client would feel more able to be vulnerable mm. or as you're saying bob the client is defending against vulnerability and they're just using the fact that they're a therapist as a way to do that which is also fine but i i found that to be pretty rare mm. I, I find that i don't know about your experience but mine is that when therapists show up to therapy they usually use it pretty well mm-hmm. because they know what it is they know what they want they know they know what therapy does they know how therapy helps and they also know that beating around the bush and not being vulnerable isn't going to help them and so they don't want to waste their time you know and so a lot of therapists that come to me they really go for it and uh and i you know i like working with them mm-hmm. having said that it's not like therapists don't have problems you know i i've treated therapists who have some pretty deep personality problems that are not easily worked on you know they're just as just as um tenacious as as a client who isn't a therapist and um and i'll I'll tell you mo answer me this bob but Mm -hmm. for me all the therapists that i've treated pretty quickly i i forget that they're a therapist what about you yeah i think earlier in my career i used to feel intimidated by that um now i it's just not really much of a concern i don't even it's it's not on my radar i'm just like with this human Right. Yeah. Other question. Have you noticed whether therapists use usually work more effectively with other therapists that have a similar approach? What do you think, Bob? I don't know. Um, I've had a lot of therapists. I think I've had probably between 10 and 15 therapists over the course of my life. And usually what I find myself doing is adapting to their style. So I had a therapist that used acceptance and commitment therapy um, not, but not in a formal way, but in a, in a um, informal way, more say maybe a more eclectic way. And so I would adapt her style, and then my current therapist has a certain approach, and I find myself adapting that. And um, uh, the focus that he has in our work has become a focus that I hold in my work with my people. In other words, ther- therapy is a training ground for me to learn something about how to do therapy. Um, but I had a therapist once who was a psychic and she was, I could never do what she does. And I found her enormously helpful. And she, I was referred to her by my couple therapy super at, supervisor at the time. This is a long time ago, 15 years. And he said, look, Bob, I don't know what she does. I don't, I can't do what she does. I don't, but she helped. She helped me. She helped my family. So go give it a try. And I went and saw her and I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. She did these things that I don't know how to do. And um, I actually took training from her after um, we worked together for a while to try to learn what she does. And I, I discovered that that's just not my forte. That's not what I'm able to do. So I can't do what she does. And I really respect her and found her enormously helpful. Well, what did she do? Well, I won't be able to talk about this in any kind of... Um, Expert way. S- yeah, no. She did a thing called muscle testing. You probably know what that is. No. That's the arm push thing. We push your arm down. Yeah. Um, She did, I think they call it educational kinesiology. Is that, is that a, have you heard of that? Never. Yeah. I think that's the term for it. Um, She did these tapping exercises on my chest and on my back. How long did you see her? um, Probably about six months. And what did it help for you? Some of that's personal that I can't talk about. Oh, okay. uh, Believe it or not. And, um, (laughs) Uh, what did it help me with? The thing I remember that it helped me with is personal and I don't want to talk about it. And the other things I can't remember, I just remember 
that it was a helpful experience and I really liked her. I really enjoyed seeing her and working with her and I really enjoyed the benefits of that. But forgive me, I, it's 15 years and I just don't remember. So out of the 15 therapists that you've been to, what rank would she be? Oh, good question. Top five. Top five. Top yeah. three? Give me a sec. Da, na, na, da, yeah, right, right, right. Na, na, na. Top, top five. Top, top five. five. Okay. Yeah. And when you took trainings from her, why uh -huh. didn't it work for you? Well, I took one training from her. It was a couple of days long. So generally, a couple of day trainings are just sort of get your feet wet, learn a little bit. So they're not really designed for anybody to become an expert. And I think she was... She had many, 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 many years of practicing what she did and lots and lots of her own personal training. Um, so, you know, two-day training isn't going to change anybody's life, um, um, isn't going to change anybody's capacity to practice. You'd have to do that more more often. So um, I think that's part of why. And I didn't pursue it any further. My um, training interests were in different way, went in different direction. So that's probably the main thing. But I really do believe that um, she was a psychic and that the things that she's capable of are simply things that I'm not capable of. You believe that she has supernatural powers. I mean, you say that she's a psychic. Okay, then yeah. You do? Yeah. You believe she has supernatural powers and she used those powers to help you? Yes. Okay. Yeah, interesting. It's a little weird, isn't it? No, it's... The, one of the more common belief systems in, in the world, and I don't have any scientific response to that, mm -hmm. and a lot of people will report those experiences for sure uh, to be more, I don't know, mainstream about it. Mm -hmm. People will go to church and pray uh -huh. for strength, and mm -hmm. they'll get strength. Mm -hmm. They'll pray for help with a medical problem, and the medical problem will be alleviated. And if you ask them straight up, do you believe that a supernatural power helped you in this instance? They'll, they'll, they'll say yes. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I don't have, I, I, I'm just, I just didn't know that, because you're an atheist, right? I am. Yeah. So I, I just didn't know that you had this asterisk to your atheism. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not a happy atheist, that's for sure. Maybe we should talk about that sometime. What do you mean, you're not a happy atheist? Oh, I wish I believed in something beyond... Um, yeah. Well, listen, saying that, I recognize that I'm contradicting myself because I'm saying that this psychic really helped me, and she did. Um, and at the same time, I, 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 I suppose this is internally inconsistent, but I do not believe that there is any existence beyond this like once you die that's it game over yeah but i'm not happy about that it doesn't comfort you oh a atheism does not comfort me no. you wish you could be a atheist. theist yeah i do yeah very much it'd be nice i would i used to be and that was better that was better how'd you lose your religion as michael stipe said? i read uh that cosmos by carl sagan oh yeah and that was it that was a tough weekend what do you mean? Um, I had just gotten engaged to Colleen. I We were on vacation. You were I a read... theist before you got engaged to Colleen? Yeah. Oh, like yeah. an agnostic or a Catholic? Yeah, yeah. Not a practicing... I mean, I grew up Catholic, but not practicing and not involved in any particular church, huh. but a belief in, belief in God. Um, and I read Cosmos, and I'm like, okay. That sort of puts things in perspective. And it told Colleen, and we had a pretty hard day about it. I think it question, made her question whether or not we would be a fit. Um, and I think one of the things that's happened is it's made her question whether or not I look down on her because she's a theist. And the truth of the matter is, is I do not. I have a little bit of envy for her because um, there is comfort in, in belief. And um, I have nothing but respect for people that i i think atheists can get this rap of being this smug superior morally whatever you know that have a corner on the truth market and look down at people who are theists i suppose there is that element 
of atheists out there, but I am not one of them. I, first off, I would never disrespect other people's beliefs. And let's be clear that atheism is a belief. It's a belief that things are a certain way. Um, but it isn't any more... I have no... I have no... I cannot prove that there isn't uh, God or something beyond this life. I can't prove it. Nobody could. So atheists just believe that things are a certain way, just like theists believe that things are a certain way. It's still belief. Um, but I just don't do the moralizing. And I love talking about spiritual matters with my clients and with my wife. Um, I really love talking about uh, that part of people's lives, A, because it's an important part of most people's lives, 95% of Americans believe in God, right? So to dismiss that would be, first off, hubris, secondly, just rude and impolite, and third, counter-therapeutic, right? Yeah. Yeah. With your therapist, or with the, you know, she was not a licensed clinician. She was a psychic, correct? I don't. I don't know her licensure. She was not a licensed clinician. No, I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. And is it possible that, do you, do you know much about somatic therapies and people using no. sort of hands-on sort of uh, techniques with clients? No, I don't. Um, well, there is a very small percentage of therapists that are doing some wonderful work with what they call somatic types of right. therapies where they might put hands on but or they might direct you there's dance movement therapy as well which is along these lines and it can be very uh, transformative for people you know when we talk about things that can be very transformative but there's mm -hmm. more something more fundamental about physical mm -hmm. touch and moving our bodies we've mm -hmm. uh, uh, always been able to move we haven't always been able to uh, or for most of us, we've always been able to move. F but uh, for some of us, we've only been thinking about our emotions rather recently, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of our body knowledge or soul or personality is is physically based and movement based and and body body based. Body keeps the score. The, this the, the mm -hmm. book, and there can be a lot of wonderful work. And so I wonder if. And I don't know the answer, obviously, but let's say she w was a trained clinician and used non-psychic language and did a similar thing, like where she, you know, tapped on your chest and instead of seeing it as like tapping into your, some supernatural spirit or something, she's saying, uh, pay, by paying attention to this, you're getting in touch, you know, what's happening for you, I guess would be a question like, I'm going right. to tap on your chest. What's going on with you mm -hmm. right now? And you'd be like, well, actually it's reminding me of this thing. Okay. Tell me more about that. And like, what do you want to do with that? Do you want to talk about it? How do you feel about it? And, and just helping you integrate yeah. the feeling in your body and, and having someone that you don't know that well, but you feel mm -hmm. good around like touching your chest. Like that's a very vulnerable curing a uh, corrective experience that you might have. Mm -hmm. uh, given your experiences, could another therapist that didn't have the point of view as the psychic have helped you in a similar way, do you think? Yes, absolutely. I, as I understand it, the two main ingredients that uh, cause help to happen are that the client believes in the therapist and that the therapist believes in the therapy. So, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, um, I think that, um, we can get a little bit rigid, um, like this culture or whatever can get a little bit rigid and believe in, you know, like empirically validated principles or scientific, you know, I, that's not quite what I mean. Um, we can narrow our focus to what's observable and lose something, but let's say I've got preverbal trauma moving might be a better way to connect with whatever that is than words because it is preverbal. Well, the way I would put it is that our empiricism gets pointed at certain things because as yeah. a culture, we privilege certain things. Yes. If it, you know, there's actually a fair amount of empirical evidence that movement and touch in therapy can help people. Yeah. It has to be done in an ethical way. And there's a whole ethical uh, a corner of our 
there's a whole uh, there's a corner of our profession that actually uses touch and therapy and they have a, their own set of ethical principles that they follow regarding consent and all these kinds of things and uh, so it but i agree with you that the kinds of things in our field as as clinicians we will hold up as like a, a legitimate therapy doesn't include everything that empirical science has demonstrated that helps and uh, including somatic therapies for sure uh, if you if you told someone oh i went to a therapist oh what'd you do oh we didn't talk about anything like she just touched me the whole time people would be like whoa unethical illegal it's you know gross and ew and because we live in a touch phobic society mm -hmm. we we've never been more touch phobic as humans than we are in our society today. Uh, when I was growing up, I remember people touched each other and I, I get it. We want consent and we don't want people to be harmed and we want people to not be abused. But at what cost mm -hmm. do we just throw all touch human touch out the window because we're trying to avoid abuse? I don't think that's a good answer. And that's essentially what we've done, mm -hmm. uh, which is just, uh, really not great. Now, of course, sexual harassment, touching in the workplace, this is a problem, and mm -hmm. a lot of people are abused by this. But uh, so we're we're heading in. We have a long way to go in that direction. Anyway, uh, another question here. Patron Arthur says, "I have a question for Bob. How do you, Bob, feel?" that your attachment style has aided you in your work as a therapist? How do you feel like it has hindered that process? Since you have to navigate a disorganized attachment style, has it been difficult at times to attune to your clients? Bob, what do you think? Great question. Uh, for, there's two questions here. One, how has it helped? I think um, between having my experience and training, I have a capacity for empathy, um, and I suspect that both are necessary. Just having my experience by itself is not sufficient, so just having a disorganized style is not by itself sufficient. And just training alone can't teach empathy. So as uh, David Whalen, this is a psychologist, says when he gives these trainings, he says, well, I learned all of my clinical skills when I was six at the knee of my mother, right? So I guess I can relate to that because I learned a lot of what I know at uh, in my childhood from my childhood experiences and including the fact that it's left me with this particular attachment style so that's that's how it's helped how is it hindered my heart rate goes up too fast and often too often i can be very timid i can get really scared um sometimes i can get really angry as a therapist yeah. yeah and perceive threat where perhaps it isn't I miss the boat, but you know all therapists miss the boat, so it's not like I'm unique in that. But um, I can I can at times dysregulate. So the main ones for me are shame, fear, and anger. I don't have a problem with sadness. I don't have a problem with joy. Um, I don't think those things are inhibit me. But shame, fear, and sadness those emotions can get in the way, and so I can perceive danger, threat, where it isn't. It can um, interfere with um, uh, case conceptualization and maintaining a clinical perspective. When you feel like you're being threatened, uh, where you can feel, sorry, that's not the right way to put it, because it's not like my clients come in and threaten me. When you feel under threat, when I feel under threat, um, I respond just the way anybody's body responds, which is, you know, my prefrontal cortex doesn't work as well. I can't think so well. And I'm just like, how do I survive this moment? So uh, the compensation for that is training. Um, vulnerable training. I, I, one of my capacities is I can lay it all out there and it can cause an enormous amount of shame for me to be that open. But I, I, um, I have an ethical responsibility to my clients to, um, I believe, to keep my counter-transferential responses um, mine and not let them, as best I know how, nobody's perfect, and but not let them interfere with um, the work I'm trying to do with my people. Would you have been through so much therapy and healed so much and worked so much on yourself if you weren't a therapist? No, I doubt it. Where would you be if you weren't? 
a therapist. And because you're so dedicated, the reason why I ask is you're so dedicated to your work with your clients. You always have been ever since yeah. I met you. Mm. And through that, I, yeah, it makes sense that you would say, no, I don't think I'd, because you go to therapy. I mean, what percentage do you go to therapy so that you can be the best therapist? Oh, wow. That's an interesting question. 40%, 50, somewhere in there. Yeah, that's interesting, right? Because mm -hmm. I, yeah. I mean, because uh, the assumption is you go to therapy for you and oh, for, your, for your marriage, which is also true. It is but, true. But 40, 50% of the reason overall that you've gone to therapy is so that you can be a better therapist for your clients. Oh, well, wait a minute. I think I might have misheard your question. Oh. Um, no, no. Uh, I'd say that's a fraction. I actually don't go to therapy to be a better therapist. I do oh. supervision to be a better therapist. I do training to be a better therapist. I, I guess I was mishearing your question. I believe that one of the great side effects of being in therapy is it does make me a better therapist, but it isn't my um, uh, presenting motivation. What did you mean by 40 to 50%? I mean that I don't know. I don't, I've done a lot of training, but I believe that being a client and having an experience of therapy has been by itself an invaluable training tool. Well, you know, they, they still call it training analysis, right? And just in sort of maybe lifelong yeah. training analysis. I don't do analysis, like the psychoanalysis thing, but but um, I use uh, what happens, what my experience of being in therapy, I use that to inform um, how I work. Yeah. Like, like being a couples therapy client helped me be couples therapy being a couple therapy client helped me be a couple therapist it's not the only thing and it isn't the main thing but it definitely is a thing right and if you weren't a therapist you presumably would have gone to a lot less therapy is that what you're saying yeah i'm pretty sure i would have and where would you be today in your life do you think i'd probably be an accountant I'd probably okay. be a CPA. Why? Because that's what you were thinking of doing back in the my, day? Yeah, my dad was a CPA. And um, uh, because I'm in practice for myself, I run my own business. And what I've discovered, two things I discovered about that. One is I really like running my business. And, you know, like bookkeeping is interesting to me. Colleen, she'll joke. She'll say, oh, you're going to look at porn now, huh? Which is my bookkeeping because I really <laughs> enjoy looking at the, the QuickBooks <laughs> thing and all that. Anyways, but... But one of the ways in which I could actually really relate to my dad is he was also a business owner. He owned his own CPA practice. And unlike my sibs, he and I could talk about that because we both had a similar experience. And he would actually talk to me. And there would be this really nice exchange. I really, that's my, when I think about my dad, that's one of my favorite things is that he and I could actually really talk about that stuff. And it wasn't like the bookkeeping is important. I mean, it is, it's useful and it's interesting to me. So that's part of it, but that I could have a connection with my dad about it was really means something to me. It's valuable to me. Yeah. That said, if I wasn't a therapist, I don't think I would bother with therapy and I don't think I would develop, be as developed as I am or as conscientious as I am. And this is probably true for you. Do you ever look back over the last 10 years uh, and think about the way you used to practice and compare it to the way you practice now and notice growth. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, me too. I do that all the time. But I don't think any of this would happen if I wasn't a therapist. I think if I were an accountant, I'd be a, someone in the dark, an enormously less self-aware, yeah. difficult, moody, shame-based, um, um, irritable. Yeah. Um, I think all of these things... And, and, and like the, the other day, the other day, true story, Colleen was telling me about her work situation and a stress that she has at work. And I'm listening to this because I listen to, you know, we've been together a long time and she talks about work and it's stressful a lot of the time. So she's telling me about the stress at work and I can feel myself doing two things. One is getting irritated and the other one is um, feeling like responsible, like I got to do something about it. Well, if I wasn't a couple therapist, I wouldn't understand that from an attachment lens, from from uh, through looking through it uh, from uh, through an attachment lens. Yeah. So what I said to her a couple hours later was, when you talk to me about the stress of the thing, what goes off in me is, I've got to fix it, and if I don't fix it, I have no place here. 
And so sometimes I get angry with you because I can't fix it. I actually can't. Your stresses are your stresses. And I want to offload responsibility. And one of the ways I do that is I, you know, I I don't necessarily act angry. I don't like say blah 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 blah. I mean I have done that, but but it's it's inside and I find myself having an angry dismissal, like, you know, why can't you get over this? Why can't you, you know, whatever, you know, that sort of thing that um so anyway, so I'm saying this to her. I'm saying this is what's going on for me. And what I need is I need to know that it's okay if I don't fix it. It's okay if if I don't, that I still have a place in our home and in your life as your partner if I don't fix it. And she said to me the thing that she always says, which is she says, Bob, I don't expect you to fix it. And even as I say it now, I feel sad and relief that, oh, I don't have to fix it. If I was an accountant, I'd probably be dismissive. I probably would know that it made me anxious. I probably wouldn't even realize that I would just get dismissive. And I think about my dad a lot with regard to this because that that is a big part of how he was. He just didn't have awareness of his own experience of things in enough granular detail to recognize that other people are not responsible for his pain and that he actually has power. And so what he would do is he would alienate friends. It used to drive my mother crazy. He'd alienate friends when they did something that crossed him because he didn't have a way to talk to them about it properly. He didn't have a way to ask for what he need or even recognize that he had a need. And that would have been me. I'm convinced. And it's why I don't want to be a father. Hmm. Because I know I would do that to some poor defenseless child. And I would shape them. And I don't want to do that. So I'm happy. I'm a really great uncle. I love being an uncle. But being a dad, no. I would have, I would have messed it up. I respect your decision, obviously, sure, yeah. but I, I don't think you're correct. I think <laughs> you would have had, you know, you would have damaged your kid like anyone else would, but mm. I don't think you would have been anything like your father was to you. I, I think you would have, for whatever mistake you would have made, which all parents do, you would have made up for it in the same way that you always do with Colleen. Maybe. I have the benefit of being a therapist. So if I wasn't a therapist, I would have fucked it up. Sorry for swearing. I would have messed it up. Yeah. A I mean, lot worse. who knows, but... Yeah, it can't be known. But yeah, it's interesting. That's interesting. And it's interesting to think about myself as well. And mm. I, I agree with every descriptor and adjective you had there of mm -hmm. dismissive, mm -hmm. irritable, bad mood, uh, distant, mm -hmm. judgmental... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, uh, struggling silently. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that that would have been me if mm -hmm. I hadn't become a therapist. Mm -hmm. And when I think about all the personal growth that I've been through uh, in my life, mm -hmm. along the lines that we're talking about, mm -hmm. I would say ninety percent of it is because I am a therapist, not because I was a client, mm -hmm. because. Whenever I'm treating someone and something comes up in session that is uh, analogous to my own life, mm -hmm. I'm soaking up what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like uh, learning as I'm walking someone through something. I'm like, oh, actually, that really applies to me, too. <laughs> and there's nothing, I don't know, to me more, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, change, changing than for me to go, well, what if someone, what if I were to follow that mindset? <laughs> you know, what if I were, because it really, because it's not someone telling me something, right? It's me telling someone something and going and feeling like I, like I know what I'm talking about yeah. and then going, well, wait, mm -hmm. I need to follow that. Because if someone else tells me it, then I'm like, well, you don't really know the situation. Come on, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I'm at a paradox. I either have to shoot down myself professionally or I have to shoot down my defenses to thinking more healthily. And, you know, I guess sometimes I do both. Sometimes I do either, but. Right on. But what about you? Like how much of your personal growth percentage wise between your being a therapist and the, all the thought processes outside of sessions that go along with it? 
And I will even say the podcast. I mean, everything professionally oh, yeah. that I've done, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. podcast, being a therapist, being a yeah. professor, all these things have uh, contributed, I would say, much, much more to my personal growth than, than being a client. What about you? Mm. Well, I think I've been a client a lot longer than you have. It's more than half my life that I've been in therapy. Right. So I don't know if that makes a difference. But Probably does. But yeah, for sure. Like that story I told you about what happened with me and Colleen the other day, I felt all those ways. It was It's sort of there in sort of, you know, on the back burner in my brain. But then I, I met a new couple and they wanted to know something about what they could expect if they hired me. They were kicking the tires, which I think is a very good idea, guys. Shop for counselors the way you shop for a car. Do a lot of test drives. You're better off. So anyways, they were shopping. And I. they said, what can we expect? And I'm telling them what I think they can expect. And I'm sort of saying it from a more theoretical point of view. But then I started thinking about the interaction I had with Colleen. And so I just used it. I said, oh, just this morning, blah, 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 blah. And then after I got finished telling them this story, I said, I'm going to have to go talk to her about that now. Like... Like, so the point I mean to make is just like you, I'm listening to myself as I'm speaking and I'm getting insight into my behavior as I'm describing, you know, what I think happens between couples. And then I go to her later that day and I have a nice moment of connection with her that I probably wouldn't have had if I hadn't told that story. Yeah, same. Yeah. Uh, Let's go on to another email. Patron Belina from Gainesville says, can you talk about self-actualizers? You've mentioned before that most of your, of your clients fall into this category as a self-actualizer, and I'm trying to imagine what they're like. What types of things do they come in for? Just normal relationship problems? I guess I'm wondering what sets them apart, whoever you're contrasting them with, which I, sub, which I assume are people with diagnosable mental illnesses. Bob, what do you think? I don't know. I mean, self-actualization is from that, uh, that Maslow thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, so what I'll say is that I don't usually say that, uh, and I don't know, I, I can imagine myself saying this, Patron Belina, and I remember saying it at least once, but if you were just to ask me, you know, what sort of clients do you see? I wouldn't say self-actualizers, uh, uh, depending on who I was talking to. I would say people who want to work on their relationships. That's what I would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, people who have conflict with their spouse, um, people who have conflict at work with their coworkers, people who have conflicts with their families. And I could frame that in mental illness, you know, because these individuals often do have a diagnosable mental illness at, or mental disorder in DSM, adjustment disorders, attachment issues, grief issues, depression issues, anxiety issues. But that's not the center of the treatment by any means. It's it's attachment and relationships and emotional regulation and um, r- corrective experiences around past relational traumas. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes in my field, we'll call this like the worried well, or we'll call it self-actualizers. And so if I ever use the term self-actualizer, I guess I'm in the future, I'm just going to try to be more specific because if I, if I just if I just, describe someone as self-actualizing in therapy, I would say that they were very exploratory. That, And I've had clients like this too, who they will come to me and they will say things like, so I don't really have anything wrong with my life, but I, I just want to explore who I am and what's going on in my life. And I just want someone to have a conversation with around that. And those people, I would say, are self-actualizers. They're not, they don't really have a problem in their marriage. They might not even talk about their relationships. They are just trying to figure out who am I and what is the meaning of my life. And that's a pretty rare client, but it definitely happens. And I would say those are the self-actualizers. Or maybe someone who just wants to become a better sports player or a better worker or they want to be more successful or something. Again, it's pretty rare, but those are the people that I would say are self-actualizers in that there's no real clinical issue and they're not even working on relationships, which I consider to be a clinical issue. The fact that things aren't in the DSM doesn't make it non-clinical, by the way. Uh, So it's going into another email. Anonymous patron says, I have read and heard many times that depression is contagious and the same for other mental illnesses. What are the facts about this? 
How is a depressed person supposed to act in order to not spread depression to close friends and family? It is confusing because in order to heal, you're supposed to open up and talk about your emotions in addition to going to therapy. But if you do, you might be risk you might risk spreading the depression to others. Bob, what do you think? Well, emotions are contagious, right? Exuberance is contagious. Anxiety is contagious. Yeah. You just pick up vibes. I think of emotions as the first Wi-Fi. You walk into a room, you've got a feeling. You're giving off something as well as taking in the feeling around you. So that's just par for the course for being a person. I don't know that people that have depression have to avoid um, whatever influence their depression has on. It seems like impossible. That's like saying you're not allowed to breathe air. Right. You know, you can't, you can't not. Right. So if I have depression and I have had depression and I, um, um, infected having, someone else. <laughs> yeah, that's even a crappy way to put it. I have an impact on somebody else because of my mood. I mean, I should hope I would. Yeah. Right? I mean, I matter, don't I? And yeah. Anyways, at least in some circumstance. Um, th- there's, so there's no getting out of that. And I don't think there's any need to try to control for it or think that it's bad or wrong. I don't think that's the case. Um, we are, at the same time as we're impacted by one another, we are indeed each responsible for our own experience of things and what we do with it. So if if my depression has some impact on somebody else, they do have the power and responsibility to look after themselves, whatever that happens to mean. And I don't think it means that they have to shun me, especially if there's someone that loves and cares about me. Why the hell would they want to do that? Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if I agree with this idea that they have to be, that, that, that we have to not have an impact or we can only have certain impacts. Those are the okay ones. Like allowed to share joy, right? I, you know, yeah. We're, we're not made that way. We're herd creatures. Yeah, you said it all. The only thing I'll add is that research just does show yeah. that it it is contagious, but not depression. Depression isn't contagious, but thinking styles and belief systems are contagious, um, and also just vibe. And yeah, being around someone who is is deeply depressed, like when I treat people who are deeply depressed, it is uh, draining to me as a, as a, as a therapist, if I'm treating someone who is manic, hypomanic, then oh. I'll, I'll have a lot of energy in yeah. that session. If I'm treating someone who is elated that they just won the lottery, then I'm going to be kind of, you know, jazzed up during that session. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. And as Bob says, it's not your responsibility to suppress yourself. It's the listener's responsibility to do what they can to, get the support that they need. You know, if, if I become depressed talking with a depressed client, it's not the depressed client's fault. <laughs> it is just a, a, an effect of their suffering. And I know how to take care of myself. I talk about things and uh, I have my mindfulness, uh, pseudo mindfulness practices, this kind of thing. But yeah, research does show that mm-hmm. uh, certain kinds of elements are contagious. Like there are certain experiments that they've done where you put someone who's suffering from major depression in a, in a group of people, and the people around them are more likely to adopt negative thinking styles, pessimism, hopelessness, this sort of thing. Not extreme, but a little bit. And those thinking patterns can exacerbate someone's susceptibility to depression, but it's not going to cause someone to be depressed. You, you know, you would have to you'd have to be near someone a long time who was susceptible or on the brink of depression anyway, and, and you were just one of the hundred factors that pushed him in that direction. So mm. you deserve to be yourself and to express yourself and to be heard and to get support. And if that is contagious to other people, then those that's just a, what's going to happen. Um, you know, if if someone has a pet die or a loved one die and I'm talking to them, client or friend, and I'm sad because of that, that's okay. <laughs> we're, as Bob saying, we're herd animals and that's our, I don't know, human mandate is to be with people, not only just physically, but emotionally. And, and then we do what we can to get support for our, ourselves. And that's just fair. So the fact that you are depressed and other people might be influenced by that, you know, uh, I think is, it doesn't mean you're supposed to somehow like not be yourself. 
maybe you 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 get support from people you know who have support or you talk with people around you you know maybe maybe that's part of the your responsibility is back like, hey you know i know i'm depressed and i know that talking with me might kind of make you depressed too sometimes or might be kind of a bummer to you and i just want you to know i care about you and i love you and i yeah. i i don't want you to be depressed as well and so i i just wanted to tell you that i'm just kind of worried about you and it would really be devastating to me to think that i would somehow ruin your life and you know the other person likely is going to say you're not ruining my life it's fine i'm okay yeah, yeah uh, you're not in a great mood and and it it does uh, it does affect me but but i'm fine you know I, i'm doing okay yeah so uh, uh so yeah and to be clear depression itself is not contagious like uh, the major depressive disorder cannot be transferred to another person <laughs> uh no matter how much time I'm not prone to depression. So if when I hang out with major depressed people, there's no risk of me becoming depressed because I'm not close to so you know, you have to be in that direction anyway usually. Um or the only thing that's contagious is like slight ways of thinking this sort of thing. Anyway. These things are also temporary. Right. Right. So when you change the environment, you're going to change the impact. Right, exactly. Yeah. All right, Bob, final word on today's episode in which we answered almost every single email on the doc. Well, hats off for that. We got almost all of them. How many How many do we miss? Uh, just one. Oh, just one. Should we do it? No, it's kind of a long one. We'll save okay. it for next time, yeah. Okay. All right. It's, a, it's kind of a juicy one. It's about clients having sex with their therapists. And Whoa. There's, there's some stats in there that we can actually I'll quiz you on when we talk about it next time. Oh, okay. I'll probably fail. <laughs> um, final thoughts. I enjoyed being here. It's nice to see you again. Yeah. Talk. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was a pretty interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. Me too. Um, I have a feeling we've talked about this before in terms of your atheism and whatnot, but, hmm. but not in that way. Hmm. And I really like talking about stuff like that. Me too. Me too. I like it a lot. Yeah. All right. Everyone out there, take care of yourself because... Thank you.